session is sharing memories. How did the folks set about educating children for social change in the decades after World War II? Implicit in the title is the possibility that the folks approach to education for social change has changed over time. Um, the Woodcraft folk today isn't necessarily approaching that in the same way they approached it after the Second World War. I've written a book which, self-published, uh, attempts to look at what I think were uh, significant shifts in the way in which the Woodcraft folk approached education for social change in the interwar period. Um, I'd be more than happy to take comments, however critical, um, or questions in relation to that. But in this session, I wanted to push it a little stage further. You see, I was uh, born in 1952, and uh, in 1963, as you see in the picture, I was just about to become a pioneer. And uh, my experience of the folk, obviously shaped how I approached the book. Um, I think that one of the points that came out of a, uh, a seminar or a symposium, as it was called, on education for social change at the Institute of Education was the idea that maybe some of the history of the folk should be written from the point of view, not of the adult leaders, but also incorporating the experience of children and young people. Now that's quite difficult for the 1930s for obvious reasons. Most people who were young or children at that age are no longer with us and, and archive records are very scarce when it comes to those sort of experiences. But we can do a little bit more when it comes to the post-war years because people of my generation lived through those. In my case, uh, my memories are mainly confined to my uh, pioneer years and adventurer and and early leader years in the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, but there are other members of the folk who have been through that and maybe they could contribute their memories too. Now, memory is a difficult thing. It's fickle. You, you not only are selective in what you remember, but you're also influenced by subsequent developments and experiences. And in my case in particular, I would say, I've been influenced in my understanding of the folk by my parents and relatives who have also been active in the folk. Um, in this picture, which is taken from my grandmother's uh, photograph album of Woodcraft folk, uh, 1945, you see uh, uh, ballooned in the uh, top row there is Basil Rawson. Basil, along with people like um, Henry Fair and Teddy Hawkes uh, were not only active in the folk in the interwar period, but also carried the folk through in the post-war years. And so was true of on the right, on the second row down, my grandmother, uh, Ivy Burston, a uh, folk named Greenstar, and my mother on the left-hand side of that row, who's ballooned, uh, was also involved in the folk as a teenager in the 30s. Below them is Arthur Kesterton, I think. I'm not absolutely sure. He was the leader of my pioneer group when I was growing up in the folk. Now, my point here is that my understanding of the folk was not only influenced by my own experience directly, but also the experience of my family and my family's friends. And um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that all my family holidays were woodcraft holidays. Nearly all of my family outings were woodcraft outings. Uh, that's simply the way in a very small organisation, very committed to the woodcraft folk, that's the way it worked. And so there was no separation for me between how I saw the woodcraft folk and how I saw my family. They were part of the same continuum. With that kind of warning in mind, therefore, what I'm going to do is talk about my own experience. But first, I just want to suggest a way of corroborating those personal experiences which may not reflect the general experience and which are tainted by being a memory. I think that when I 
was researching the book, one of the books I came across was a book by Olive Brown called Who Was Leslie Paul, similarly a self-published book. And talking about the activities in the book, she said something that really struck me. She said, what I and others came away with was a sense of common purpose, that we were part of a whole, something bigger than the group or the in, an individual. There's a general aim which embodied very deep ideals. Woodcraft had its own atmosphere. We knew something that the rest of the world had yet to find out. That last statement was not made lightly. There was such a thing as woodcraft attitude, a subtle combination of each person having equal worth and potential as an individual, plus the need to work together to achieve the maximum for all. Now, I think a lot of young people in the folk today, people who later on in the 1990s and 2000s uh, were in my Woodcraft Pioneer group here in North London, I think a lot of them would find that that statement said a lot about the folk as they experienced it. But I want to explore here two particular parts of this. The first is that there was a general aim which embodied deep ideals. The second is that Woodcraft had its own atmosphere, and in particular, we knew something that the rest of the world had yet to find out. So here are my memories in relation to those two points. First, there was a general aim which embodied very deep ideals. Well, span the world with friendship was the slogan that the IFN was reformed around, or formed around, as the International Falcon Movement in 1953. And if you asked any pioneer at the time, certainly from my recollection, if you asked them, what did the Woodcraft folks stand for? They'd say, span the world with friendship. And there was a very practical expression of that. Member organizations across borders exchanged delegations and attended common camps uh, in order to build friendship and experience friendship across borders. Um, I think this was a very uh, real experience for young people. In my own case, I can remember very distinctly um, going to a Woodcraft International camp uh, at Dan Campney near Sirencester when I was about 11. Now this picture is actually taken from the Woodcraft Heritage site, the 1951 International Camp, but the torchlight procession seems to have been something that was repeated for the next uh, next number of international camps and at Dan Campney I remember us marching as a camp everyone in the camp with torches around the lanes not through the streets it wasn't a demonstration it was around the country lanes and turning back eventually to arrive at the campsite where we all stood in a huge circle with the remaining torches still burning and I can remember across the field hearing the voice of someone who I think was Teddy Hawkes, who's a very charismatic speaker, explaining the ideal of international friendship and why we stood for Span the World with Friendship. It's a very, very moving and emotional experience for me as a 10, 11 year old. It's something that remained with me during my time in the Woodcraft folk. It wasn't simply an empty slogan, it was something that I could appreciate. Now, of course, in the, in the mid 50s, the Woodcraft folk began to develop links, not just with the IFM member organizations, but also with Eastern European uh, organizations in, as it was termed, the communist bloc. And this drew a lot of criticism, as many of you all know, from other member organizations of the IFM on the basis that this was extending an olive branch to the communist world um, and indeed the woodcraft folk had a lot of internal and external criticism uh, i exaggerate when i say a lot of internal criticism some internal criticism and a lot of external criticism for these links when i was about 12 i went to east germany uh, with the woodcraft folk as part of a delegation with bob sandal and uh, this was my first experience of these international exchanges. And it seemed to me a, a natural progression from what I experienced on the international camps of the Woodcraft folk. 
the first I really appreciated about how significant, significant it was that the Woodcraft folk was having these exchanges with Eastern Europe was actually not till later when I was about 14. Our school had an exchange with students from a, a town in West Germany and they were coming over and one of them was staying with me and so my father suggested that the certificate I'd obtained at the camp in East Germany um, that said I was a potential astronaut or something like that, uh, this certificate should come down off my cupboard door because it might upset my guest from West Germany. Um, my father had a lot of foresight because when I went to Germany the following year, I actually found out that um, the person I was staying with, their, their family were closely linked with the NPD, which was the kind of neo-fascist organization in Germany at the time. Now, I didn't take from that that all West Germans were fascists or anything like that. My education in the Woodcraft folk had warned me against such generalizations, but it does illustrate the tension that existed around these international links. Now, another element of the Woodcraft folk at that time, I think, was the use of ceremony. And to what extent did Span the World with Friendship get developed in, as a theme through these ceremonies? I can remember the ceremonies very clearly. Every elf in the and pioneer group night, you recited the creed. And there were lots of ceremonies at camp, in particular the camp firelighting ceremony, that uh, we used on a very regular basis. When you look at those ceremonies, this theme of international friendship is not so clear cut. Leslie Paul said that, uh, I think around 1940-41 in a, a Woodcraft journal, that these uh, ceremonies were intended to be poetic and that's certainly the case and with poetry comes a degree of ambiguity uh, ambiguity designed to get the reader or listener to actually think a little more deeply about the words being said but you can see that uh, the theme of international friendship here uh, a heart that is courageous and bears goodwill to all men uh, how can you be courageous in the sense that would normally mean courageous, willing to fight, uh, and at the same time bear goodwill to all men? And, and Leslie Paul explained that in terms of the courage taken in order to bear goodwill to all men, to not be engaged in war and fighting. But this was very, very unclear to me, and most of these ceremonies, ceremonies uh, like the envoy, um, peace unto all, peace unto all, notwithstanding, a lot of these ceremonies were more about the individual, how the individual should be, how the, what the individual should strive for. And as you can see, it was very much wrapped up in this image with Woodcraft folks, Red Indianism, the teepees, the campfire, the drums, the totems, the symbolism of the uh, association with the idealized Native American Indian. Now, this hadn't gone from the Woodcraft folk in the post-war period. Uh, this is another picture from my grandmother's uh, photograph album uh, of uh, S.H. Walker, folk named Taronki Wambly, at the White Forest in 1947. And up on the right-hand side, you can see the 1944 publication, Camp and Trail, which he wrote, which is illustrated with the uh, Indian chief pointing the direction to the young woodcrafters uh, and in the background the teepees of an encampment. Uh, the use of folk names, the painting and decorating of tents, he's sitting in front of his tent in the picture and you can see a buffalo and an eagle painted on the side of the tent. That kind of red Indian imagery was part and parcel of the woodcraft folk in later years. Um, it was starting to disappear, but you can see that in 1947, uh, this is my grandmother's uh, uh, little caption, Indians do their stuff. Um, the Woodcraft folk was on occasions playing Indian. Um, and whilst that uh, receded, I can't remember Birmingham Woodcraft in my time having a totem pole. 
I know that a lot of other districts did have totem poles and erected them at camp, uh, and that the notion of the idealized Indian was still contained in the songbook in songs like um, Blue Lake and Rocky Shore. So whilst it was declining, it still, in my view, obscured my understanding of the folk ideals at that time, because it emphasized this uh, ideal of the Native American Indian. That lasted even when the Woodcraft produced Woodcraft Way by Basil Rawson to replace the folk and trail. And you can still see that the badges, uh, the camper badge is a teepee, uh, the uh, naturalist badge is an eagle's head, the uh, craftsman's badge is a totem, um, the uh, festival badge is a drum. These same images were still repeated. But of course, by this time, the uh, system of badges and tests became essentially the Woodcraft Folk's national curriculum. Uh, if you look at the um, archives at the time, it was intended that group nights would regularly follow different aspects of these test badges. Um, I can remember uh, a fairly half-hearted attempt to do this in terms of my own pioneer group. I remember Arthur Kesterton showing us how to pitch a tent and trying to stick drawing pins into the wooden floor of the school hall uh, and failing often. Um, I did attempt myself on becoming a helper to my brother who took over the pioneer group in, when I was 16. I, um, I attempted to use the Woodcraft Way as a tool for the more educational content of group meetings. Um, to some extent, you could do that. You could reproduce the map of a field with woods and a stream, etc., and ask them to draw an outline of how they would plan their camp site. Um, but it was limited. In particular, I was becoming more political at that age, and I was looking at the citizen and world citizen badges and wanting to do things with them. But I tended to find them very, very um, much about organization. Uh, they were about the trades council and how it functioned. They were about the co-op and how it functioned, about local government and how it functioned, about uh, the United Nations and how it functioned, and UNICEF and how it functioned. It didn't really give me a feel of a labor movement history or a feel of the labor movement as an active force in society. Uh, it reminds me when I taught politics um, at A level uh, in a further education college, uh, at AS level, it would all be about the structures of parliament and pressure groups and so on. And at AS, A2 level, it would be all about political ideology. Well, the Woodcraft Way was a bit like that. It was all about structures and very little about ideas, as far as I could understand. I tried to explore other avenues. I tried, for example, a session where we played pop music, partly because that was an attempt to key into the interests of the pioneers, but also because it was the period of the crossover in, in pop music, the crossover from African-American to white and North American and, and European music. And I was trying by using the Beatles and the Stones and soul music to encourage a discussion about uh, where our music comes from. Uh, but I, I was inexperienced and uh, naive and having difficulty with doing that. Uh, in many places, I think, and particularly that's my own experience in Birmingham, despite the efforts to continue with badge work or test work, uh, there were very severe limits to that. There was another aspect, however, to the Woodcraft folks' education for social change. And I think that was never in the center of the Woodcraft folks' stated process of education, but it was always present. And of course, one element of it was that if you're for spanning the world with friendship, then you're opposed to war. Um, in 1958, the CND was formed and the annual marches from or to Aldermaston began. 
and in uh, 1960 the Woodcroft folk debated uh, at the ADC whether to move the date of the ADC from Easter so that people could participate in the march. It, it wasn't carried but there was clearly a current of opinion and by 1961 the folk conference was sending a telegram to the cited 120, 120 woodcraft marches on the Aldermaston march uh, expressing solidarity. I don't think it was ever formally adopted by the woodcraft folk that it supported the aims of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. I personally can remember as a child going on one of these marches I don't remember whether I was part of a woodcraft contingent or whether it was simply a a family affair. As I say, the lines between the two were very blurred for me as a child. But I do remember the songs that came out of that, songs like The Age Bomb Thunder and songs like uh, The Strangest Dream, which became part of the folk lexicon. They were sung at camps, they were sung uh, at group nights on occasions. They were part of the subculture, if you like, of the woodcraft folk. That developed further as the 1960s went on. Um, the 1965 bombing of North Vietnam resulted in a shift within the peace movement as a whole, within CND as a whole, to highlighting the issue of Vietnam. As you can see, these are this is again from the Woodcraft Heritage site. Uh, here, Woodcrafters are marching with the uh, banners, Vietnam mothers love their children too. The children of Vietnam are our children. And at the 1967 annual delegate conference, which I was present at, uh, there was a motion put that the Woodcraft folk should uh, condemn the bombing and support peace through negotiations, and in particular efforts to solve the problems of Vietnamese children, particularly through medical aid for Vietnam. Um, I can remember sitting and watching the debate, I think I was 14, 15, um, and very much in support of the motion. And I was kind of astonished when, when the motion was carried. Four or five teenagers, roughly my own age, maybe a little bit older, got from up on the floor of the conference and went round collecting for medical aid for Vietnam. Again, that that made an impression on me as to what the Woodcraft folks span the world with friendship uh, meant. Now, there were other elements of the Woodcraft folks subculture, in particular its songs, which I remember very clearly as a child. Um, the 1957 Little Rock confrontations over desegregation of schools followed the uh, uh, Supreme Court verdict that the schools had to be desegregated and there was a song written at the time to celebrate that, um, that uh, ruling of the Supreme Court. The first verse of it is up there, it says their robes are black, their heads were white, the schoolhouse doors were closed so tight, nine judges all set down their names to end the years and years of shame. Now that is actually the original first verse to The Ink is Black, The Page is White. I don't know at what point the folks started to incorporate the songs of the civil rights movement into its songbook. The songbooks are never dated as far as I can see uh, and into its broader activities. But certainly as a child, I remember Come By Our, We Shall Overcome and so on. Um, of course, these were songs that were popularised by folk singers like Dylan, Baez, Pete Seeger, um, and the Woodcraft folk's tradition of using folk song as part of its subculture uh, extended to the incorporation of many of these protest songs. I can also remember that there weren't many black people or people of colour in the folk at that time. Uh, this was something very new to us. To me as a child, I grew up in a part of Birmingham that you just didn't meet black kids. Very, very exceptionally, there might be one in your school. Um, we didn't really know how to relate to people of colour. And I think the folk had a similar problem. There's one resolution I noticed in one of the uh, ADCs saying the folk should step up its attempts to 
uh, established groups in uh, what it called immigrant communities. I think it was aware of that, but uh, overall, the, uh, the approach was one of echoing the ideas of the civil rights movement. It became part of folk culture. Never explicitly voted on, I don't think, but understood. Now, I had a direct experience of uh, issues of anti-racism uh, when I went to an ADC in 1970 as a teenager, 17, 18, I can't remember exactly my age. Um, it was in the context of the Springbok tour and protests over anti-apartheid, uh, the rugby tour in 69 to 70, and then the cricket tour projected for 1970. Uh, these were direct action protests, of course, led by Peter Hain and anti-apartheid. Uh, and in the case of the cricketer, led to remarkable scenes, like you can see on the lower photo, of barbed wire protecting the uh, cricket ground from being destroyed by anti-apartheid demonstrators. Now, at that ADC, there was a motion put to support the protests, and um, a counter, or not counter motion, I saw it as a counter motion, but an amendment which said uh, we should also deplore, and then it produced a series of situations in other countries, in particular in Eastern Bloc countries, uh, that the Woodcroft folk should also deplore. I haven't been able to trace the resolution yet because of COVID, I can't go to the archive. Uh, but I seem to remember the treatment of, uh, of uh, people in Tibet was quoted in relation to China. And I listened to the debate and I just felt really angry. I felt that uh, the whole point of the resolution was to identify the Woodcraft folk with legitimate protest over apartheid in South Africa. And this amendment was taking away from that. So I got up and spoke on it to that effect. And uh, I can remember Peggy Aprahamia buying me a drink in the bar afterwards, sort of as a thank you for having done that. But I mention this because it seems to me that there's an element there of, uh, not because it was me, but because I was a young person, the vote actually shifting in the conference as a consequence of that. And I think this is to some extent what happened in relation to the Vietnam issue in 67, that it was the support of young people for that stance which swayed the Woodcraft Folk as an organization. You see, the folk had a real problem about whether or not it was possible for an educational organization to take any sort of political stance for obvious reasons. Um, the predominant view in British society was that education was neutral politically neutral. Um, so it raised questions for the folk about how to answer it. Now, the picture you see there is my dad, Ted Polzer, with next to Margaret White. And I think uh, at High Park, they were probably met up at a demonstration of some sort. My dad was on the education committee in the folk council of, uh, of the folk for a time. And I asked him whether the folk was political. And I also, at a later date, asked Margaret White, and they both said, what do you mean by political? Margaret White was very clear, all of life is political. Everything is affected by politics, you can't avoid it. My dad made a similar point. He said, uh, yeah, uh, there's party politics and then there's politics. And the Woodcraft folk is talking about politics. It's not aligned to a political party. This kind of explanation didn't always, I think, from my experience at ADCs, didn't really um, satisfy the section of the folk who felt it was stepping too far uh, along the line of identifying itself politically. Was it socialist, I asked my dad. He said, well, it's not professing socialism. What it's doing is, educating children in the values of socialism. And so I asked him what he meant by that. He said, well, take Woodcraft Camp. When you go to camp, you all work together. However old you are, you can make some contribution to the running of the camp. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're a leader or a child, or male or female, doesn't matter whether you're six or whether you're 18, you can make a contribution to the running of the camp. And you can also contribute to the joint entertainment which we provide each other with at camp. In that said, the sense, my dad said, we're creating a socialist community in which children can learn that way of life, those sort of values. Um, well, whether you could call it socialist or give it a slightly less perhaps provocative title of cooperative, uh, I think there was an element of truth in what he said. To me, that's how I understood the Woodcraft folk. And I think that explains a little bit what Olive Brown when she meant when she said Woodcraft had its own atmosphere. We knew something that the rest of the world had yet to find out because you couldn't find it out if you weren't part of that experience of the camping community. That's why it was something for the folk itself or perhaps similar organisations for the folk itself to experience and to enjoy, rather than something that you were proclaiming to the rest of the world. And I think it links to where she went on to say, there is such a thing as woodcraft attitude, a subtle combination of each person having equal worth and potential as an individual, plus the need to work together to achieve the maximum for all. I think that you would probably find most people in the Woodcraft folk would see that as being the case today. Uh, I can remember uh, camps where teenagers would shout out to pioneers or elfins. That's not very Woodcrafty. That was an expression of the idea that there was something about a Woodcraft attitude that you acquired through the camping activities. So those are my memories. Um, for those of you who are of my age, I'd love to know what are yours. Um, for those of you of a different age group, I'd love to know how you see the woodcraft today in comparison to what I've suggested was the education for social change in my day. Thank you. Lauren, do you want to kind of bring people in? I can bring people in, or I think maybe if you stop sharing your screen, Rich, then we can maybe just mm -hmm. be nice and cooperative and woodcraft folk like and just be able to see each other a bit clearer and have a conversation if that works better for people. Much better. Perfect. Now we can see everybody. Apart from me, I know, but you can see the word person. But um, who would like to, would somebody like to say something, then we can get going. I'm going to pause. Interested in the